All right, kids, today we're going to be talking about models. What are we talking about? Models? We're talking about models, man. All kinds of wonderful, fabulous models. Uh, okay, we're going to be talking about urban models today. Maybe not quite as sexy, but interesting nonetheless. So, in this video, we're going to ask this essential question. How can models illustrate American cities during the early 20th century? Now let's take a look at some of the actual models you need to know. The first one is the concentric zone model, which was actually organized by Ernest Burgess back around the 1920s. Now he used Chicago as a model to understand how this whole thing works. And if you look at it, it looks identical to the von Thunen model. In fact, there are some very similar assumptions that he made as von Thunen made. For example, you have an isotropic flat plane, or you have a uniform surface, basically featureless and no barriers. You talk about the importance of centrality, or the accessibility to the market, in this case, the CBD. And that's why you see it all concentrated on one place. Furthermore, individuals would seek to increase their profits, or also to reduce their costs. And as in von Thunen, transportation cost is also very important. It's proportional to the distance in all directions which is why you see it as perfect circles in all directions. And of course, there is one single market, the CBD. Now this can be divided up into different zones. In the very first one, you have the CBD, the downtown area, where many people work here, but only a few people live. Then moving on to zone two, which is basically where you have a lot of factories, warehouses, and rundown housing. Very low population density, but those who do live there are usually very poor. As you move further away, you get two other apartments and a few houses, but mostly the blue collar workers or the lower class workers. Moving further away, you get to zone four, which is more of the middle class or the single family houses for white collar workers, more of the executives, people who would be managers or other higher level administrators. And then finally in zone five, you get to the upper class, the spacious estates for the high income business people. Back in the 1920s, where most people could not afford automobiles, those who could, use their money wisely so that they can move away to where it was less noisy, less crowded, more open, more desirable. And one thing about this model is to understand that it was dynamic. The cities were growing and growing very fast. So if you take a look at a neighborhood here in the blue, and as the city would continue to grow, you see that it would encroach on the inner rings. So actually that neighborhood would go down in value as the inner rings would affect the outer ones. In this graphic, you can see what would be the actual perfect concentric zone model, or basically what he looked at was Chicago in the 1920s, where you have the nice downtown area, and as you get further and further away, to actually um, nicer apartments as you go further and further out. Now moving on, we'll take a look at the sector model. To understand how this becomes more complex, you have to realize what was going on. As time went on, and technology improved, especially with transportation, the cities have become more complex. And this was the observation of Homer Hoyt, who made this model in 1939. He criticized the Burgess model as too simple and too inaccurate. He noticed that growth would create these pie-shaped urban structures that were connected to the land rent. Zones could extend from the CBD out to the outer edge. So in this case, you could see that low rent residential areas could go from the CBD all the way to the outer edge. The same would be true for transportation zones, or if you had middle class or even upper class zones. Now what made this possible was the streetcar. Hey Stella! Hey Stella! Streetcars still exist in many parts around the world. They are self-powered light rail vehicles often powered by electricity. The reason why this made a pie-shaped sector model is because just the same way if you were to go on a subway today, if you're going to go two blocks or five blocks or 20 blocks, you're going to pay the same amount just to get on and move. And this is why lower class residential areas could extend out or the middle class or even the upper class. And as opposed to the concentric zone model, if you were a real estate developer, you'd want to be very careful about where you built. So in this blue zone, you see right outside of a high residential area, you can see as the city would continue to grow, that actually would be in a nicer area. So understanding the sectors more than understanding the zones would give you a better understanding of the actual value of the land. Uh, 